So that's kind of my cue here. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, it's 2.16, so we can go ahead and get started now. Uh, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Yes. Yep. Good. All right. So this is the Future Proofing Your Drupal 7 site. I couldn't find like a good song for Future Proofing, so I had to go with Bulletproof. So it is close. Um, uh, and I've given this talk before, um, so if you actually have seen this before in like uh, DrupalCon uh, Austin, um, I probably would recommend go to something else. Um, but if there's a lot of good information here, so if you haven't seen it, please stay. Um, and uh, my Twitter handle is Dave Reed. If you'd like to tweet along uh, during the presentation, um, my tweet notifications are turned off, though. However, so I will not see them. Uh, and, and if you can follow along the presentation as well, uh, there's a GitHub link. Uh, DaveReed.github.io uh, slash future-proof. Um, and that's up to date with what I'm presenting right now. Uh, so you could follow along, because there's lots of links here too. So it's a good link to have, and I'll post it on the session page afterwards. Because um, we're going to go through a lot of good modules and information here. Um, so yeah, let's get started. And there we go. So a little bit about me. Uh, I, I'm Dave Reed. I'm a senior developer at Lullabot. Um, been working with Drupal for about eight years now. It feels like it's been forever. Um, and again, my Twitter handle there, I like to use my real name everywhere, so I'm an IRC as Dave Reed as well. Um, and I kind of had this reputation in the Drupal community as being the module guy. Um, and I've got that reputation because I wrote, I've written like 120 modules so far. Um, so, I like, I do it in my sleep, I do it in my spare time, I write modules when I'm at work. Uh, it's just kind of what I seem to do. I like doing that challenge. Um, and I think we calculated it out. There's like, at one point I had touched like almost 2% of all the contributed modules in Drupal. Um, and then I actually wrote a module to count how many modules I'd written. And then I wrote another module to count how many modules on a site were in it, like, that you had enabled had been written by me. Um, so that, those two don't really count. Um, so yeah, and I, I have uh, two cats, Rodney and Athena. Rodney's kind of like the unofficial Drupal mascot. Uh, well, that's the kid. Uh, that's, that's Rodney and Athena. He's the orange one. Um, and my kid, Oliver, I love him to death. And he's going to be a big brother, too, soon. So yay. Uh, I'm excited about that. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, I, like, I know a lot about modules. Um, so this is a great presentation, because it's like, Things you can do in Drupal 7, modules you can pick, uh, ways to architect APIs um, to make your site a little bit better for Drupal 8 when it comes out. Um, so, you know, again, this is, you know, for your site builders and your architects, people actually putting the sites together, um, some informed choices they can make, modules they can pick, themes they can use, um, that'll help ease that transition. Uh, and I like to ease that transition because every new version of Drupal comes with this cost. Uh, cost to the people that are actually working on the site every day to retrain them on how to use Drupal. Because we change everything, every major version. We love that as developers, but the people that actually end up using the site, you have to spend time training them how to do it. So if there's like little things that you can do throughout this process to make you know, these changes as minimal as possible, I think that's worth it. Um, so, and uh, the unofficial, like, title of this uh, session is to backport all the things. Um, so one of the ways that I write modules is, uh, oh, that sounds like a cool new Drupal 8 feature. I'll backport that to Drupal 7, because uh, I know that I can't use Drupal 8 on client projects yet for, you know, at least a year still. Even though we got beta 1 today, yay. Um, I want to make sure, I want to use this stuff now, um, which is uh, kind of what I do a lot now. All right, so we're gonna chunk this, gonna chunk this up into separate parts. Um, there's going to be uh, some more that are just like the module choices and user interface things that you kind of we see every day. Uh, there's gonna be more of a developer portion, but we're not gonna get too in depth um, about code or anything. It'll just kind of touch uh, briefly. Um, so that's kind of the two big chunks here. Um, so we'll just dive right into user interface section. Um, so this is all the the front end goodness things that you can see as a, kind of a site builder, that kind of stuff. It's not just code. Um, and I can't really touch on too much more of the user interface, user interface parts before talking about the Spark distribution. Uh, it was a uh, 
team and an industry install profile started by Acquia uh, a year or two ago to try and improve the content creating and editing UI process in Drupal. And what they ended up doing is making all these new modules first in Drupal 7 um, in, with the intent to bring them into Drupal 8 uh, to kind of experiment with them. And I actually love them for that because that's how I love um, when we experiment with things with the current version of Drupal uh, to get it, feel like you to get it right first before we put it into the actual version of core uh, that's coming up next. Um, rather than say a module like overlay, which was experimental in putting it into core first, rather than trying it in contrib. I don't know how anyone, if there's any, is anyone a fan of overlay? I'm sorry. Okay, good, there were no hands. Okay, woo, the jokes are gonna be much better throughout the rest of the session then. Um, good. Uh, so one of the big first projects to touch on is Navbar. So it's you know the administration navigation throughout your site. Um, core ships with the default toolbar, um, and that one's okay. Uh, most people install the admin menu module, and I actually like that one a lot too. Um, but there's this new navigation called Navbar, um, and the purpose of it is to make sure that it's a responsive, friendly navigation. Um, so you can see, kind of see here in the screenshot, you know, with your desktop viewport, it kind of looks more like a normal navigation bar, uh, maybe a little fancier with uh, some fancier icons. And then when you shift down to the mobile viewport, uh, you get actually a different, it's more of a vertical menu. Um, and that works with Drupal's administration menu and lots of other integrations out of the box. Um, so I really like this Navbar project. I think it's a really good one for like the content creators and content editors, not necessarily admi the administrators on the site. Um, so if you'd like to use this like with admin menu at the same time, um, there's actually a separate project called admin select um, that I should link here and I'll write in my notes afterwards to do so, um, that lets you assign a default module to use per role. So like your administrator role can get an admin menu, but your other roles can get navbar. Uh, and it's just kind of nice if you don't need to expose all that crazy uh, admin menu options with all the drop downs there right and visible, uh, they can get this one instead. Um, so I, I really like using this one. Um, another really interesting feature that landed in Drupal 8 was inline editing. Um, so like if you're actually viewing a node, you can actually like hit a little contextual menu for quick edit. And instead of going to the node form, you stay right there on the node view, uh, and you can like edit fields and change the body text and change the title text. And it's uh, very handy for that use case. Some would uh, say that that workflow maybe isn't the best, uh, especially if you have like the concept of revisions and unpublished content and that kind of stuff. Like, it's good for quick fixes, I think. Um, so if you'd like to use this functionality in Drupal 7 now, um, there's called the quick edit module, very aptly named. Um, it has a couple of dependencies, but it's pretty much uh, a straight backport of what's in Drupal 8. Um, yeah, there was, there was some weird naming. It used to be the edit module, now it's the quick edit module, because uh, it got renamed in core and all that fun stuff with having to keep up with, with uh, Drupal 8. So one of the things I am just most excited about in Drupal 8 uh, is we've officially decided on one supported WYSIWYG, uh, and that's CK Editor. Um, so like it ships out of the box with Drupal Core and, and Drupal 8, um, and it kind of has like a, uh, if you're familiar with the WYSIWYG module, um, where it lets you select which editor to use for which uh, text format you're using, um, we kind of have that light functionality in Drupal 8 as well. Um, but I just love that the, we've like, yes, we're gonna support CK Editor out of the box for everything. Because um, I maintain another module called the Media Module that has had a hard time trying to support all the various different WYSIWYGs and like all the different formats. And when you're trying to do advanced stuff like embedding images and media, they can get kind of hard to do. Um, so I'm really, really hopeful that in Drupal 8 moving forward, um, those modules that have those advanced things can uh, have a much easier time. Um, and as a developer, I like having an easier time. I, I hope you do too. Um, so there is a module uh, called CK Editor that you can use right now in Drupal 7. Uh, a lot of the people that were involved in making this in Drupal 8 uh, were responsible for backporting this and kind of keeping it up to date. 
Um, you can use up to the CK editor like 4.4 or 4.5 version, like whatever the latest is, um, which I would highly recommend. Um, so I think it, if you even have an existing site and you're using a different WYSIWYG, I would see if you could switch. Um, it may not be an easy switch, in which case I'd just say stay uh, on the current version you're working with. Um, but if you're choosing a new site or you can make an easy switch right now, I would definitely start using CK Editor. Um, so I'd switch to that. Uh, we have a, well, a new theme in Drupal 8. Um, the Bartik theme was added in Drupal 7. And as of Drupal 8, that theme is now responsive by default. Um, but the one that we added in Drupal 7 was not. Um, so some lovely people have backported this to a theme in Drupal 7. So if you're one of those people that uses the default theme to show off Drupal, uh, or on their personal website that may be www.davery.net, I'm not naming any names for people that use the default theme, um, but it might be me, um, you can use this one instead. Um, and like, if you're just needing to show Drupal off as a demo, it'd be nice to have this used. You know, that way you can show at least Drupal can be responsive out of the box. Um, so that's a nice one to have. Um, one that I was kind of fairly involved in the Drupal 8 process um, with uh, contributing to core uh, was HTML5. Um, so there's these new HTML5 input elements like email, URL, telephone, uh, dates, that kind of stuff, that if you were on like a mobile device and you clicked into an email field, uh, it would know on an iPhone to provide you with, you know, an at symbol by default. Uh, right there rather than having the key to it. Um, or if like uh, it's a URL field, it'll know to put .com in there uh, and email fields as well. So it's just a nice handy way because you wouldn't get that with normal input fields. Um, and it's a very just handy thing for your end users and your people that are visiting your site. Um, say for like contact forms and that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you'd like to use HTML5 input elements in your Drupal 7 site now, uh, there are kind of two modules to use for that. Uh, the first one is the elements module that kind of provides them to be used by other modules. Uh, it doesn't actually swap anything out in core. That's what the second module, HTML5 tools, does. Um, so that, like, goes in and changes the email field on user sign-up pages with an email element um, and that kind of thing. And switches, it provides, uh, say, if you used a number field uh, uh, in Drupal 7, it lets you actually use an HTML5 number element where the user can click up and down and increment or decrement the number instead of typing in the number they need to. Um, so it's just a handy one to have on, on hand, um, just to have. Another great awesome improvement in Drupal 8 is views as in core. Hooray! Yeah. Um, so everyone installs the module. Everyone should be using views. Um, so if you're not using views, you can use the views module. Um, and it's readily available in Drupal 7. Um, so it's, it's pretty much, a, I think what got into Drupal 8 is pretty much exactly the same. Um, so yeah, you could be using this now. Uh, and kind of along with that views theme, uh, some other things got in uh, Drupal 8 as well. Um, so all of our content listings, user listings, uh, all those good screens that were listings of things are now powered by views in Drupal 8, since we have views in core. Um, but these were not powered by views in Drupal 7, uh, but there is a module that you can install called admin views to override these with a view version of them. Uh, and that way you can actually edit and tweak them if you needed to uh, add fields and customize them, um, which is really handy. Um, so this is a good one, just another good one to just throw in every site uh, by default because I always feel like I'm ending up having to add additional fields to content listings or add another filter. That's really handy too, um, to being able to add another filter to your content listing page. Yeah. And kind of along with that, uh, in Drupal 8, we added a kind of light version of views bulk operations. Um, it lets you, on a listing page, lets you do uh, a an operation like delete or unpublish uh, to multiple numbers of, of nodes if you've checked them or checked all of on the page. Um, so I would totally encourage people to be using this right now uh, on your listings um, in Drupal 7. And I believe the admin views module like adds support for this if you have it available uh, or either has a dependency on it. So it's a good one to have around and to start integrating with now. Uh, another 
interesting views module, uh, if we want to go back to kind of the responsive stuff, uh, is views in Drupal 7 ships with a grid style uh, for your views, uh, a way to display them. Um, it unfortunately uses tables to display this grid. Um, so if you need to display them in more of a responsive fashion, where if you were to shrink down the screen, instead of you know side by side, you get just one column of four. Um, there's actually a module right now called Views Resp Responsive Grid uh, that does that for you. So I would not use the default grid built in views in Drupal 7, I'd use this one. Um, and this is what got into Drupal 4 in Drupal 8. Uh, another interesting module with responsive and views, if we're continuing along the same theme again, uh, is responsive tables. Um, so we had this problem with trying to make these ad administration screens uh, mobile friendly uh, in Drupal 8. And how we kind of decided there's several different kind of options for making listings of things responsive. Uh, and what we decided to do with Drupal 8 is to kind of identify which columns are high priority um, and those columns, let's see if I can explain this well. So there's either no priority, high priority, or low priority. Uh, and you designate your columns either low priority, high priority, or none. Uh, if the columns are none, it means nothing will happen to them. They will always be visible. If they're high priority, it means if you were to shrink down to maybe a tablet viewport, uh, the things that are low priority would drop and be not visible, but things that are high priority would stay. If you were to shrink down to a mobile viewport, things that are both low priority and high priority would shrink, would get removed. And only the things that you haven't set priority for would be visible. Um, so it's just a, another way of like providing the most important information. Um, and you set that directly in your view. Um, you specify which columns are which priority, uh, and you don't have to like do any CSS or JavaScript, it's just handled for you. Uh, and there's a module that I backported called Responsive Tables um, that you can use and does, provides the same exact functionality in Drupal 7. Um, along the same responsive theme, there's the breakpoints concept. Um, so in Drupal 8, we added a breakpoint module so that we could specify like where those kind of margins are in your viewports. Um, so where does the tablet you know, kind of viewport happen? Where does the mobile viewport happen? And it's kind of used as an API for other things, um, which I will talk about. Um, so it's not really used for the table thing, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's more used for images. Um, but uh, the module that lets you define breakpoints uh, is called the breakpoint module. Uh, very aptly named. Um, and you can use this right now in Drupal 7. Uh, and it's built into core. And the reason you'd want to use this is for responsive pictures. Um, so there's the picture module in Drupal 7 uh, that lets you define if this, uh, that lets you say, okay, at this breakpoint in my tablet viewpoint, I want it to display as this image style. Uh, it may be one to display as like the, the large image style. But at the mobile viewpoint, display this image using the thumbnail image style and let you change which image style is used uh, to display the same picture uh, depending on the breakpoint. Um, so these two modules work together really well. Um, and this is pretty much updated along with core as well. Um, so it's kept very up to date, uh, even with all the uh, changes in how to handle responsive pictures that are happening all the time. Uh, they're doing a very good job of keeping up with it. Um, so you can use that right now as well. And in uh, Drupal 8, I believe it's called like responsive image. So there's a little bit of a name shift. It's picture in Drupal 7, but responsive image in Drupal 8. So this is one of my favorite things as a developer. Um, it's tours. So Drupal 8, we added this functionality uh, using a, a JavaScript library to kind of add these nice little uh, like demonstrations or tours throughout an administration page. So the first time that you hit the views uh, maybe like you're creating a new view, there's this little help option that pops up in the, in the nav bar. It said, hey, would you like a tour of this page? And you click that and it says, here's where you type in, you know, the title of the view. Here's where you select the fields that you want to add to the view. And it kind of points you to specific parts of the page and has next, previous next. And you can navigate back and forth just to kind of give a little bit more helpful showing of where you should be doing things. Um, and it's really helpful for stuff like, how do I enable uh, another language in my site? 
Uh, we have a multilingual tour in Drupal 8, uh, and that's super, super helpful. And so I think this is a great thing as a developer you know, to provide for if I have a complex UI that I added in a module, uh, or even for end user, like your site visitors, to add a tour to a specific page that you have. Um, I think this is a great, great pattern to start using. Um, and there are tours in Drupal 8, but in Drupal 7, it's the Joyride module. Um, there's a whole, I think it's just mostly a library in Drupal 7, uh, so I think you'll have to kind of write a little bit uh, more custom code um, than you do for Drupal 8. They're kind of defined uh, in code. Um, so yeah, this is available to use, and I would highly encourage people to check that out. So module page filtering is an interesting one. There's kind of the typical module that people use uh, is called the module filter module. Has anyone used that one before? Yeah, that's lots of hands there. Um, so I don't actually like use that one. Um, Drupal 8 added uh, this uh, very, very basic filtering to modules, uh, your module listing, that just basically you type in what you're searching for. And that's really all there was. That's it. Uh, it's just really, really helpful and small. Um, now, I recognize that the module filter module does more things like that. It shows you, like, sorts them by enabled or disabled and that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm sure that'll be ported to Drupal 8 as a separate contrib module. Um, but if you'd like to just kind of have this functionality, uh, and I think it's a little bit more lightweight, uh, there's the instant filter module. Um, and it's actually really handy, too, because this pattern can be used on other pages. So for instance, this is used on the permissions page. Has anyone had trouble finding and searching for things on the permissions checkbox of hell? Yeah, yeah, there's a few of us there. So this might be handy, because it, it's not only just the one purpose of the module page. Um, and you, as a developer, I could take advantage of this and use it in my own module if I had a large listing page as well. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's a fun one to use. Um, this is a very small, tweaky module called Simplified Menu Administration. Um, if you've ever gone to edit the menus on your Drupal site, it's kind of confusing. There's edit menu and list links. And if you're like, I want to go add a menu link, you go edit menu. But unfortunately, you can only change the name and description of your menu. You can't change the menu links there. And I think it's a thing that gets caught up by a lot of editors and uh, content creators too. Um, so this is module kind of resolves that and just merges those two, the list links and edit menu into one same page and only offers it as one item in the menu. Um, so if you go to edit menu, you can do that all from the same page. So this is one I just throw on every site uh, when I, from the start. Um, so I mentioned overlay, uh, and I don't actually have overlay jokes, although I should prepare them. Um, so overlay was removed from Drupal 8 core. Yay! Because uh, everyone disables it by default anyway. Um, but we had this interesting problem that we still needed to like, give someone a visual indicator of like, when am I in the back end of my site? When do I know when I need to go back? Uh, and that kind of thing. And so we had an interesting solution in Drupal 8 that with our, our navigation bar, uh, if you were to be on a front-facing page and then somehow click to an administrative page somehow, um, you would then all of a sudden have this very top left thing appear called back to site. Um, and it would take you exactly back to the page you were on before. Um, so if you were to click, keep going clicking around between administration pages, this would still stay the same link back to the first note, the first page you were on. Um, so I think it's kind of an actually really handy way of solving that. Um, and I wanted to backport this to Drupal 7, and so I did. And so it's the escape admin uh, module. Uh, and it works with the nav bar. Uh, it works with the toolbar that's built in core. And I believe there's a patch to make it work with admin menu as well. Um, so there's, it should work with all three uh, at some point. Um, yeah. Another interesting one is caption filter. Um, Wim Lears, I don't know if you've seen a presentation or saw him around this week, um, but he deserves a lot of thanks. Um, he did a really great job in Drupal 8 core um, with helping improve the way that we caption things in WYSIWYGS. Um, rather than you know, using a special syntax or a special token, um, he actually made it so we can add captions right there in the HTML attributes. Um, so this example here, 
I'm using a data attribute uh, called data-caption uh, to provide what the caption should be for this image uh, directly there. And then this gets converted to an actual uh, figure and figure caption um, HTML elements um, in my WYSIWYG. And so there's a project called Caption Filter. Uh, the, one, the version one of the module does use kind of a special weird syntax uh, for doing captions. Uh, and I'm working with the module maintainer to make a second version that's a backport of what we have in Drupal 8 core. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, you might want to be following this module uh, and start using this because it, it'll make you know, migrations easier. Uh, you want to change your content when you move to Drupal 8. Um, and the next two modules are going to be about blocks because everyone loves blocks. Um, but everyone hates in Drupal 7 how you can't output a block in more than one place. It's just, it sucks. Um, so the first module here is called Bean. Uh, and Bean, uh, search, it's trying to solve the fact that custom blocks in Drupal 7 are basically only just a text field. Um, and sometimes we have a more advanced use case. Maybe you want to add a link field to your block um, rather than having it put in the WYSIWYG. I, I think it's better to have structured data rather than just shove everything in the WYSIWYG. Um, so uh, Bean lets you make custom blocks with fields. Um, which I think is really great. And it's actually very, very similar to what Drupal 8 has. Um, you can create custom blocks in Drupal 8 that, and any different types of custom blocks, and you can have fields on those. Um, and it's really, really great. So if you'd like that functionality, uh, I'd recommend Bean. And I talked about the fact that you can't reuse the same block like in a different region on the same theme. Um, but there is a module to solve that. It's called the multi-block module. Um, so if you have that use case and you're not using something maybe more like panels or context, um, you just want to keep it simple, you could definitely use this module to try that out. All right. So next quick section, that was a lot of front end stuff. Hopefully everyone's still with me here. Um, we're going to cover some new field types that were added to Drupal core um, that you can use right now in Drupal 7. So we have entity reference fields. Um, typically in Drupal 6, there was like the, the node and user reference fields. Um, and we're really, really trying to get everyone away from using those. Those are completely deprecated. Um, and entity reference is now like the de facto module to use. And this has actually been added to Drupal 8 core, uh, which is why it's in this presentation. Um, so definitely be using this. It's really handy because it can refer to all different things. Um, lots of modules integrate with entity reference and do special things with, ent with entity reference fields. Um, for example, I've written a module that like, if you have an entity reference field on your node, you can configure it to delete all the things in your entity reference field when your node is deleted um, and can cascade that delete down, um, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, but that's only available for entity reference. Uh, if you have a need for phone numbers, like in contact forms, that kind of stuff, um, typically people use the phone module in Drupal 7, um, but actually there is a, a different module I recommend using uh, that's much more similar to the Drupal 8 version, and it's called Telephone. Um, not confusing at all between the differences of phone and telephone. Um, and it's very, very simple. It's just basically an HTML5 telephone input. There's not a whole lot of validation that happens. Uh, if you need that validation and, and want that validation, I would probably recommend the phone module. Um, but if you don't, and I don't think it's a good idea to have that validation because phone numbers are hard, um, I, would, I would check out the telephone module. It's just easy and very, very simple. Um, yeah. Uh, we added an email field to Drupal 8 core. And it's very, very simple. It's just an HTML5 email field. Um, so there's just the in-browser validation that happens to make sure it's a valid email address. There's something much else that happens. Um, there is a project on Drupal called Email that's available for Drupal 7. I think most people are using that already. Um, but just have an understanding that the version that's in Drupal 8 is much simpler than that. Um, and if you have that HTML5 tools module I mentioned earlier, uh, it makes it so your email fields in Drupal 7 can use the HTML5 input element. Uh, dates are a fun one. Um, so Drupal core added some uh, HTML5 date elements. Um, 
And it's kind of interesting. This question actually came up in my last time I gave this presentation. Like, because the date module in Drupal 7 provides you three different options of date fields. Uh, it provides you an ISO format uh, date uh, or a Unix timestamp uh, date field. So it's like, what, which one do I use? And I'm always confused by this. Um, and I now can give a more definitive answer on what type you should use. It's the date ISO format uh, field type that you should be using. Because um, that's, that's the version that's in Drupal 8 core. Uh, and the other two are essentially deprecated at this point. Um, so hopefully that gives a little bit of clarification for any site builders or people adding fields to content. So now we're going to touch some back-end stuff. A um, little bit of code, a little bit of modules. Um, so yeah, because it's, it's, it's a lot harder to backport Drupal 8 code than it is to do front-facing stuff. It's pretty easy to backport. We can emulate that pretty well. Um, but there's a lot of, I can't, if it were easy to backport Symfony to Drupal 7, I would do it. But I, I don't have that much pain that I would like to have. Um, so Drupal 8 added uh, unique identifiers, uh, UUIDs, uh, to all entity types. So to all your nodes, users, content, files, uh, all that good stuff. Um, but Drupal 7 does not have support for that. Um, so if you'd like to enable support for UUIDs, if you have issues with like de uh, deploying content between servers, that kind of thing, um, you probably have this module already enabled. Um, I wouldn't say there's a need to have this enabled right now. Um, but if you want UUIDs, this module would uh, support them for you. Um, so render caching is a really, really fun one that uh, I've been getting into the last month uh, on my project. Um, we've been writing a theme uh, in our project where we're outputting like, oh, given this node, uh, display this field uh, short title using this formatter. And like we've been outputting all these different fields kind of individually. Um, and I've, I've had this kind of nagging feeling at the back of my head watching this code go in that like, uh, this, these are uncached um, because stuff that happens in the template only really happens, gets affected in page caching. So like these are uncached calls happening to render fields um, for any logged in users. Um, and there's a great module out there um, that was started by Wim Lears um, and is continued by another developer um, called the render cache module. Uh, and it's really, really cool because it allows, like, when you view a node, it allows that output to be cached in your cache table or if you're using memcache or Redis, that kind of thing. So the next time a logged in user views that node, it's hitting the cache rather than building that entire node and rendering it again, um, which severely improves performance. Um, and then uh, it has a dependency called entity modified. Um, so I would highly encourage people to actually throw this one on every module, every project from the start, um, especially if you have lot, lots of logged in traffic. Um, it could really help improve things. Um, for the developers, um, I wanted to talk on some, some libraries and APIs and plugin stuff. So it's going to go into a little bit of code, um, but I'll keep it pretty light. Um, for those of you that need to use external libraries, or like PHP libraries in like your custom code, that kind of stuff, um, I would highly recommend uh, get started with Composer. It's the standard way to like depend on external libraries. You know, say that I depend on the Dave Reed Cool Stuff library uh, version two, and I should download that in a standard way. Um, and it's called, uh, in, it can load that code and make it available to my code to run. And that's called the PSR0 or PSR4 standard. Um, so how that's used, and this is an example uh, in a project I used recently. Um, I declared a composer.json file in my sites all directory. Um, that I had, uh, this is a book site, so I wanted to use this ISBN library to verify if an ISBN was correct, if it was an ISBN 10 or ISBN 14. Um, for book identifiers. And so I put that I required this library in my composer.json file. And then in my, the module that I needed to use, um, I, uh, in my site's all directory, I'd run composer install. It would download this uh, library for me, uh, and I would commit that to our project. And then in my module, I would say, uh, you know, require the site's all vendor slash autoload, which is the file generated by composer. 
and then I could use that library directly, um, which is really nice. Um, and if you'd like to have a better way to uh, load all the stuff from your composer file, there's some modules that will do that for you, um, rather than just calling composer uh, update and that kind of thing. So plugins, there's this whole new plugin system in Drupal 8 um, that's really, I think it's really great. Uh, Joe Schindler is actually in the room right up front here. He did a whole great documentation on how to use the plugin system. Um, but there's not really a good standard way to do plugins in Drupal 7. Um, so I'm going to kind of show you how I kind of emulate this in Drupal 8. And we'll go very high level. Um, so kind of one way that we've typically done plugins is with the hook system in Drupal. Um, so I like I have a hook my module, hook info. And I would say, you know, the label of what I'm doing. Uh, there's a function I would call if I wanted to do this thing. And if there's a settings form to configure it, I would point to that function, that kind of thing. Um, it's very, very functional, procedural kind of style. Um, but it's easy to do. I can understand that. Um, so that's one way that we've done it before, but I don't really prefer this. Uh, another way is uh, Ctools plugins. Has anyone worked with Ctools plugins before? A couple, okay. Um, I find this terribly confusing, actually. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just me. But like you have to declare like where your plugins live, you have to give it like an info file, and then there's a class or some procedural code that runs the Ctools plugin. Um, and I find this really confusing. I'm sorry, Earl Miles, who wrote the Ctools plugins. I find it confusing. Um, so what I do for plugins, uh, if I'm making an API in Drupal 7, is I like to use classes, because um, that's what the plugins in Drupal 8 do. Um, so I define an interface. Um, which has you know a method called do something, um, and then I have a base class that all the plugins should derive from that kind of takes care of some basic functionality that's shared. Um, so like the get defaults uh, for configuration should return an empty array, that kind of stuff. But it leaves an abstract method called do something. It says everything that extends this class should implement this method, but I'm not going to do it for them. Um, so it's my, that's what my base class does. And then in, if I were to provide an implementation of this plugin, uh, I would have uh, my example module. I would just have a quick hook info, because uh, it's a standard way of discovery in Drupal 7, that just says, basically says a label, and I point to the class uh, that implements this plugin. Um, and then I have my plugin file that has this do something method. Uh, and that's really all I need to do. And then, oh shoot. I did have code. I'll post it afterwards to this, this show how I would invoke this plugin then, too. But that just covers like how I'd do a plugin. If you're a module developer, uh, there's other options available in Drupal 7, and it's much easier to shift this code and port this code to Drupal 8 uh, than any of the other ways. So let's just kind of briefly cover some of the other stuff here. Um, view modes are a great, great thing uh, that was introduced in Drupal 7 uh, and is now like really, really supported in Drupal 8. So rather than like configuring a view display with like different fields and that kind of stuff, you can actually go and uh, on your content uh, in the content type screen uh, configure how like the teaser is displayed for your node or the full page is displayed for your node and you're not limited to those view modes. You can create more view modes if you need them. Like, I can make a card style view mode for a card display of things. Um, or uh, an RSS view mode for outputting nodes with RSS. Um, so if you'd like to add more view modes to your site, uh, you can technically do it in code. Uh, but if you'd like to do it through a UI, um, I'd recommend this module, Entity View Mode. Um, and it's just really, really handy. I would really encourage people to use view modes everywhere um, when displaying content. Uh, try and fit it into a view mode somehow, because it really means that this can be cached easily. It'll be much more compatible with Drupal 8, um, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, configuration management is this big thing that got into Drupal 8. You know, it's going to be like, it's going to be features, but it's going to be everything solved in the way that we want it and features that works right um, in Drupal 8. And I wish I could tell you there's a magic solution in Drupal 7 that gets this to work right. Um, but I'd probably just say keep using features. I'm sorry. Um, it, it's a letdown, I know. Um, there is this kind of configuration module that 
is kind of a little bit more experimental, but people are working on uh, that might be possible for you, I'd say give it a try. Um, but if you know features, we all been, we've all been using features for several years, I would say keep using that. Um, migrate module, it is your friend. Um, like every developer on your team should be using migrate, like at least once, get them some kind of migrate task. Like have them just migrate from a Drupal to Drupal site, I don't care, like it's gonna be super, super useful knowledge for them to have, uh, especially coming into Drupal 8, because migrate is gonna be built into core. And with Drupal 8, there is no more update.php between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. It's gonna be a migration path that you will have to write some custom code if you have custom stuff. Um, otherwise, we can configure most of how to migrate it. Um, so getting experience with using this system now is really, really important, especially um, since clients will start asking about when can we migrate to Drupal 8? And I was like, well, you have to know this first. Uh, for your team. Uh, and if you have experience using this, it'll be a little bit easier. RESTful web services. Um, so if you need to expose APIs on your site, uh, exposing, not necessarily ingesting, um, there's a couple of good options here. Um, typically, people have recommended the services module, and I think it's still okay. There are some uh, security concerns uh, as of the last year, basically. Um, and I don't think that it integrates very well like for all your entity types. Um, so there's a couple of modules here. There's the RESTful Web Services or RESTWS, um, or there's a GitHub module um, called RESTful um, that both do a really fantastic job of exposing um, for all your entity types in a much more configurable way. Um, so I would uh, encourage these to be checked out if you have an API in your site. Translation is a big one. Um, if you need to have a, a multilingual site, uh, kind of the standard encouraged way is using these two modules here, uh, Entity Translation and the Title Module. Um, some people use the, uh, 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 the Content Translation one built into Core, which like duplicates nodes in different languages, and we don't wanna do that anymore. Um, so definitely Entity Translation and the Title Module. Um, will give you a lot of support. And that's actually pretty much built into Drupal 8 core, so that's really great. Uh, Gabor is the one who did uh, a fantastic job leading that initiative uh, to make that better in Drupal 8. And there's lots of even more things I could cover, but I won't, um, like external things, like uh, testing with PHP unit. Um, there's the, all the Symfony stack that uh, Drupal 8 has uh, started to replace. Hopefully most people shouldn't know, need to know the Symfony concepts, but it can't hurt. Um, I know that several people on the Lullabot staff just like to explore making a, a quick Symphony site um, without Drupal and just kind of getting some experience working with that because it can't hurt uh, to have that experience. So encourage people to try with uh, an experiment with that. Uh, there's some JavaScript libraries like underscore and backbone which are being used in Drupal 8. Um, so those are gonna be available so I'd try taking advantage of them now. Um, those are actually dependencies for the navbar module too. Um, so you'll have them on your site if you use navbar. Um, Guzzle is an interesting PHP library for, uh, it's a replacement for the uh, fetching information via uh, HTTP. Um, so it's just a thing to get data from another server. Um, and Drupal has an internal method for that, but I would encourage people to start playing around with Guzzle uh, for that, and because uh, it's built into Drupal 8 core now. Um, and just experimenting with other stuff like uh, JavaScript local storage. Um, we're using that for the storing the back to the site link uh, in that escape admin module. Uh, and Drupal 8 is using uh, JavaScript local storage a lot more for everything too. Um, so start taking advantage of that in your Drupal 7 sites now with custom JavaScript you're writing. Um, you know, experiment with Angular and headless Drupal. It's gonna be things that are really starting to come into popularity with Drupal 8. Um, so don't get behind on those. And I really should mention, um, it's an interesting development since the last time I gave this talk too, um, is there's actually a distribution available uh, to kind of try all these things out in Drupal 7. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend it for like an actual client site. Uh, it's more just like a, hey, that's cool, let's see what it can do. Um, so it's called the pre-D8 uh, install profile that has most of the modules that I've mentioned here in this talk um, and I don't actually maintain this one, uh, which is a surprise. 
Um, but if you'd like to try all these things out together, uh, give this a try. And, of course, I've told about all these great things that are new and coming and you should be using, but we should really cover the things you should stop using, too. Um, there's actually a page on Drupal.org uh, that lists all the things that have been removed from core. Um, so things like the blog module, um, you can probably just replicate that by making a new content type rather than having a module for it. Just stop using that one now. Um, the dashboard module is actually gone. Um, the uh, Garland theme, if anyone's using that one, it's gone as well. Um, the OpenID module, that's a good one too. Uh, if you're using OpenID, uh, I believe that's probably going to be moving to Contrib for Drupal 8, um, but there are some security concerns about it as well, um, since we've had to fix those fairly recently, and we're not sure how secure it will be in its lifetime. Um, overlay, as I have mentioned and kind of joked, is gone. Uh, there is no plan to keep it in Contrib, although I'm, I guess someone could do that if they wanted to. Um, the PHP filter... Has anyone used the PHP filter? Oh, you people want to even admit raising your hands. That's great. Um, yeah, it's gone out of Drupal 8 now. Um, it's a contrib module with like a dependency on the bad judgment module. Um, so you'll probably want to investigate how to remove that um, if you can. Either move it to custom code um, or replace it somehow. So you'll probably want to get on a path uh, to figure that out. Um, the profile module is now gone. Uh, it's actually hidden in Drupal 7. Um, so I think a lot of people are using profile 2 as the module for replacing that. Um, and the trigger module is gone now in Drupal 8. Uh, and our hope is that the rules module uh, seems to be doing well with their porting effort. Um, so that should probably be the module to use then. And that's all I had. That was a lot of information. So hopefully there's still room in there for the rest of, this, of today. Um, if we have any questions, there's a microphone right up here. Uh, and I'd like to welcome anyone that has questions. And if not, you can enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, yes, right here. Yes, the question is, uh, do view modes also apply to views? Um, it does not if you're using a field display on a view. But if you're using like a display a node um, or display an entity, yeah, just I would say make your view display the whole node um, and do that and configure everything with view modes because it's way more repeatable. Like, oh, I just need to output another node randomly somewhere else. I can do that since it has a view mode. Um, views configuration with fields is not repeatable. It's only repeatable in views. So, yeah. Any other questions at all? Uh, yes. Ah, panels and display suite. What do we do with those? Um, panels, I'm pretty sure, is going to be ported to Drupal 8 as a contrib module. Um, there's not really anything available in core um, that provides that. Display suite, I think, is kind of interesting because I think it'll be deprecated um, going into Drupal 8. Um, a lot of the stuff, like the entity view mode module, supports like some of the functionality that Display Suite does. Um, you actually can manage the display of your form a little bit better in Drupal 8 core, so that kind of deprecates some of the, Drupal, uh, the functionality by Display Suite. Um, it may live on just as some of the other parts, um, but for the most, and I think there's layouts somewhere in core. We're not sure if it's going to end up in Contrib. Um, so yeah, it'll probably be um, split up somehow. All right, yes. Yes, there's, uh, it's called display modes in Drupal 8. And there are both display modes for forms and display modes for uh, like actual viewing of content. Um, so that's kind of what I was saying. You can actually configure a, like, uh, a, a short registration form for your users using a short display mode and configure how that form is displayed. Hide certain fields, change the widget for certain fields, um, but like if they are on their user editing page, it could be different. Um, um, sorry, say again? 
for, for Drupal 7, I wouldn't say there's anything that lets... Display Suite kind of does it, but it only lets you do it for one form. It doesn't add support for multiple different types. Um, so, yeah. All right, uh, if you have any other questions, come up, see me later. But thank you very much, and have a good rest of your afternoon. <laughs>